We are getting a first-hand report of the chaos that overtook the Copa America final in Miami, which included the arrest of a major South American soccer official. Plus, Jalen Brown believes Nike kept him out of the Olympics, and the Angels reached a settlement with the city of Anaheim. It's Wednesday, July 17th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Nike's influence cost Jalen Brown a spot on Team USA. When Derek White was chosen as Kawhi Leonard's replacement last week, Brown took to Twitter to express his frustration over being excluded. He directed his ire at Nike, a key sponsor of USA Basketball, saying, Really? This is what we are doing, Nike? I'm not afraid of you or your resources. On Monday at the NBA Summer League in Las Vegas, Brown confirmed to reporters that he believed Nike played a role in keeping him off Team USA and that there, quote, would be more stuff to come with that. In the same breath, he expressed support for his fellow Celtics on the national team, White, Jason Tatum, and Drew Holiday, to make clear that his grievances are with Nike, not with any athletes that he believes the apparel company influenced USA Basketball to select over him. White is a Nike athlete. Brown hasn't had a shoe deal since his contract with Adidas expired in 2021, but there are plenty of non-Nike athletes on Team USA. What Brown is probably referring to here is how he took a public stand against Nike after the brand dropped Kyrie Irving in 2022, following the whole fiasco stemming from Irving posting an anti-Semitic documentary on social media. Grant Hill, Team USA's basketball director, denied any influence from Nike and said he just felt White was the best pick for the team. The Angels and the city of Anaheim settled a long-term dispute over whether the city can build a fire station on the team's property. The team will get $2.75 million in credit for ticket and parking revenue that they would otherwise owe the city, which is about two years' worth of those payments, and Anaheim will get its fire station. That puts this particular issue to rest, but it's fair to wonder what the future is between the city and the team. The Angels' lease expires in 2029. The city has the right to demand the team make repairs to the stadium, which are estimated to cost well over $100 million. A previous stadium deal that would have had the team build a commercial district around its stadium was scuttled after Harry Sidhu, the city's mayor at the time, was forced to resign in a corruption scandal related to the deal. Meanwhile, team owner Artie Moreno briefly put the team on the market and then backtracked earlier this year. On the field, the team has spent the last decade making big moves with no real results. The same is true off the field, with the key difference that something is going to have to give in the next five years, whether that's a new deal, a new stadium, or a new owner. Amid the chaos surrounding the Copa America final, Ramon Jesseron, who is both the president of the Colombia Football Federation and the vice president of CONMEBOL, the organizing body that puts on Copa, was arrested by Miami-Dade police along with his son, Ramon Jamil Jesseron. The two are accused of attacking security officers who were not permitting them to access part of the stadium where some media personnel had gathered. They weren't the only ones. Miami-Dade County said that there were 27 arrests and 55 ejections from the stadium grounds as fans were cut off from entering the stadium whether or not they had tickets, and chaos ensued. Skip Bayless is reportedly in his final days at FS1. Joining me now to discuss is Front Office Sports tuned-in columnist Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Glad to be here. Great to have you on. So, um, yeah, we, we've talked about Skip a fair amount. Um, you, who's, you always... You know, this past year, you know, kicking out Shannon Sharp kind of seemed like the Mad King um, who is, you know, tearing his own kingdom apart. Um, What's it's still reported? You know, the New York Post has has a story out. It it seems like it's likely true. What's your reaction to Skip Bayless, um, you know, eventually departing FS1? Yeah, I think it's inevitable. Owens. Uh, for the last year, front office sports has been tracking the decline and fall of Skip's Undisputed versus... Stephen A's first take. Uh, when these shows began competing against each other eight years ago, they were neck and neck. And now Stephen A is just boat racing his old partner. In June, uh, they had something like 450,000 viewers daily to first take for 50,000 to skip. Now, you can run old cartoon reruns and get 50,000 viewers. So it, it's something had to give, and what's giving apparently is skip. The New York Post reports that he will be gone uh, by FS1 uh, sometime this summer. And what they do with Undisputed, Owen, that's the next question. My my guess is without Skip Bayless, that show goes away. There's, yeah, the question of Undisputed itself and then FS1. I mean, they lost Shannon Sharp. Um, You know, in in retrospect, maybe they they could have kicked Skip out a, a year earlier and kept Shannon around. Obviously, not anymore, but... 
Um, yeah, what does that network do in terms of you know keeping sports fans engaged? Well, first of all, they need to take a long, hard look at themselves. Uh, I understand that they had the mood inside FS1 is incredible uh, anger at themselves for picking the wrong guy. Uh, you know, they were at a point where Shannon was going like this and Skip was going like this, and they picked the guy, the wrong guy, to stick with. And in that year since, uh, Shannon has blown up into one of the biggest players in media with his Club Shay Shay podcast and his appearances with uh, Stephen A. So they need to really go back and examine their decision making and, you know, in, figure out why they picked the wrong guy. And then they need to move forward. I mean, it's not the end of the world. It's just TV, right? They still got Nick Wright. Nick Wright is a great talent. FS1 management is very high on him. They really like this guy, Danny Parkins, who they threw in there uh, to sub for Colin Cowherd. And, of course, they have Colin Cowherd, who is one of the great sports media talents uh, of all time. Problem here for FS1 is now with Skip out the door, Colin's contract is coming up, too. His deal is expiring uh, next year. And you tell me ESPN wouldn't like to get their hands on uh, Colin Howard again? You bet they would. Yeah, and he has to have a ton of leverage right now, uh, even if he does ultimately want to stick around FS1. But yeah, I mean, that was sort of getting into the next thing I wanted to ask you is like, yeah, do they do they bring in someone new? Do they try to go young? Do they try to, you know, get an established name in there so they you still kind of know what you're you're getting? Um, it's, it sounds like, you know, they've, they've got enough talent in-house um, if they just want to kind of, you know, build through their farm system. Yeah. I mean, if I'm them, I build around Colin Cowherd and Nick. I mean, I add in some new talents, but those are two great voices. I mean, let's face it. Uh, Nick is the voice of a younger generation. Colin has been on the air for 20 years and is one of the most you know respected and popular uh, talk show hosts out there. So if I'm them, I build around them, but they got to start doing something fast because remember, they got the Super Bowl coming up. And the reason why you have these studio shows, what they call in the business so-called shoulder programming, is to drive the audience to your games, right? So they need the FS1 lineup healthy and getting good viewership to promote their coverage of the Super Bowl and the NFL. Another thing, too, that, that Skip always did, uh, Owen, that you know, just I never could figure out, is the guy just talks NBA basketball day in, day out. NBA, LeBron... Clutch Gene, NBA, the Lakers. Guess what? Skip, Fox doesn't have the NBA. They don't have any rights. So instead of instead of talking about the sports that his own network has the rights to, he's talking about the sports that ESPN has the rights to. It, it just it never added up. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us on the show. All right, thank you. I'm joined now by Filippo Silva, host of the Tactical Manager YouTube channel. Welcome, Filippo. And I'm looking forward to this. It was, a, it was an interesting weekend. I'll, say, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I'm, it definitely looked interesting. So, yeah, let's, let's get into it. You were at the Copa America final. You had tickets. You did not get in. Um, just give us a, a sense of the, the scene there and just like the, the level of chaos we're talking about. But what happened first was when we got to the stadium, it was already a mess and confusing. We had already paid for parking, but the street to get there was closed and there was nowhere to get there. So we ended up having to pay for parking again somewhere else and walking like a mile to, to get to the stadium. That was the first thing. But again, so far, so good. That's not the worst part. Yeah, you're there. All right, you, you feel like you're still going to get in. Like... Yeah. And then when we get there, um, it's just overly crowded close to the stadium, which is I know some of you are going to say that's normal. I mean, 70,000 people, but it just didn't feel normal when you got there. It was confusing, crowded. It didn't really look safe for kids when, when I was there. Um, and we were noticing that it, 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 there was no one instructing. There was no security anywhere. And they just weren't letting anyone in the stadium. So after talking to police officers and some employees that were there, they gave us the information that they had locked down the stadium because apparently or allegedly someone had invaded. A few fans had already invaded. So they locked it down. So all of a sudden, we're there, thousands of fans. I'm not talking about 150, thousands, just like overcrowded, trying to get in. And they won't let anyone in, even if you have a ticket. And I had a ticket. Uh, and it started to escalate. So we, I try to go to the club level, which is where we had tickets. And they were like pushing. And all of a sudden, a group of fans, and that was a mix, Colombia fans, Argentina fans, they made a chain. And they kind of forced their way through the, the, the door. And the, the door kind of 
broke and then all of a sudden they just all started running in. Uh, did they have tickets or not? I don't know. I'm going to assume a few of them did not. And they kept like not letting anyone in. Uh, eventually, I'm recording that because I'm trying to get in the stadium recording the experience. We go through the back and then I record the video that went viral where they broke like this wall. There was a wall that they just took it down. I don't know what the wall was made of that they were able to take it down. And there was a group of Colombian fans like going through the ventilation system. Um, I don't even know how they were, how they were going to get the, I don't know if it was just open on the other side. I don't know what their plan was. I recorded and I'm like, I'm out of here. This is trouble. And then eventually um, they just completely closed the doors. And, and the people that were there on in the front of the stadium, right in the entrance, they just said, whether you have a ticket or not, it doesn't matter. No one else is going in. And so we weren't allowed in with tickets, which is as absurd as it gets. But that that's the oversimplified version of the story. If we keep talking, I'm going to go with multiple other issues that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sort of curious about that. But I, I'm assuming that at no point you didn't get any kind of like communication beyond some fans got in without tickets, so we shut things down. And then an hour, maybe two hours later, no one's getting in. And it, there is nothing beyond that no no one knew anything the 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 cops or the security the barely the the limited security that was there not doing much didn't know really what to tell us or didn't want to say anything uh the employees there there were barely any and they didn't have there was a moment where they they even opened when i was there i was a little far so i couldn't get in but they kind of just opened and let a few people in without checking tickets they just let them in that literally happened. If you were in front, good for you. You got in. Some people with tickets got in, but there were people there that probably didn't have tickets and just went in. Uh, it, they weren't checking for guns, knives, anything. So it, it, thank goodness nothing escalated. Nothing got worse. But th there was, I'm not going to lie to you, I, I think it was close to zero, the security. They weren't checking bags. They, people were jumping the fence. There were people jumping the fence. You could easily carry something inside, whatever you want to do. So it could have been really bad. I, in my opinion, again, I never organized an event of that magnitude, but my opinion, it should have been canceled. should have been, can't everyone get out? We're going to have to redo this. this. There's a lot of safety concerns here, but they went on with it. And so far, there's also not been any communication with the fans that, as far as I know, that just had their tickets and were just like, all right, you're not watching the game. There, I, I don't know of anything. So what's going to happen from there? I don't know, but it's been a mess. And 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 now they're just like blaming each other, right? I saw that Comet Ball, which are one of the organizers, they're blaming like Hard Rock. Hard Rock was like blaming, I think, the Miami police. And now they're just pointing things. It's one of those cases where the fault is mine. I'm going to put it on whoever I want. I, I don't know how it's going to be resolved, man. But we're going to get probably a lot of information next few days. The World Cup is coming in 2026 at... Stadiums across the U.S. and Canada and Mexico, Hard Rock included. Um, what I, I'm just wondering if you're like, if this affects how you're thinking about like that because like you know this was the Copa final. It's it's one of the biggest matches you know of of the decade, but there's nothing bigger than the World Cup. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering like how you're thinking about that in light of what you experienced on Sunday. You are right. There is nothing in soccer bigger than the World Cup in terms of everything. That's what everyone that 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 is the tournament. Uh, it's uh, in putting in other terms, like the World Cup final is the Super Bowl of soccer, where every, the whole world wants to watch. Uh, the whole United States watches the Super Bowl in this case. Um, I'm I wouldn't say I'm concerned because for a few reasons. One, the United States hosts massive events all the time, and we're not really known for having issues like this. It's not common uh and the organization of the world cup will be fifa not comebol and they have experience with world cups in the past and we had a copa medical in 2016 here in the united states and we didn't have these issues because it wasn't really comebol that took over everything now this time they did apparently take over most if not everything because they want to make more money i think with fifa organizing and with the learning curve that was this Copa America, because there, this wasn't the only issue in the Copa America, by the way. Okay, this was the biggest one, but there were other issues. There, there was even a brawl between fans and players in the stands. It was pretty bad. Uh, I think they'll learn from this. And with FIFA organizing, I am not too concerned for 2026. Before we we leave Sunday, is anything else that's kind of still 
lingering on your mind in terms of like stuff you saw or experienced that that you'd throw in there? I had mixed feelings of this when when the stadium was locked down. I remember I don't even know this guy's name, man. I don't live in Miami, right? So I don't know his name. But when the stadium was locked down, uh, this guy with a bunch of security just walked by and walked into the stadium, and it was the mayor of Miami. And I don't know. I, I think sometimes it, the leadership has to take accountability for all that and just kind of walk by. Sure. He can't solve the entire problem, but I mean, the guy could put in his like, call me ball. Hey, got to stop this. Got to cancel this game. Got to do it. And I, I, he saw it. I, what I'm saying is like, he saw it. He was outside. He saw what was going on. He just walked by everyone and people saw him. I didn't recognize him, but I saw people saying that's the mayor of Miami. So I'm assuming that's who he was because it was more than one person saying it. So that guy literally walked by everyone. He saw it and... I mean, seemed like he was okay with what happened. Very okay with it. Just wanted to enjoy the game and have a good time. Let's let's shift over to not the same kind of disaster, but the U.S. men's national team had a pretty disastrous Copa, uh, didn't make it out of the group stage. This was supposed to be, I mean, before the tournament started, this was kind of like the big test of, you know, do we, um, you know, is this country like ready to take on like the big international powerhouses and at least like look competitive against, you know, Argentina, Brazil, those, those sorts of countries um, didn't even really get the chance um, because they, they didn't give themselves a chance. Do you feel like how bad a sign is this for the, the men's national team leading up to that World Cup? That is, you know, the most anticipated event. I've heard some people say in sporting history, but certainly in U.S. soccer history. In, U- in U.S. men's national team history, for sure. It's the biggest World Cup they've ever had. Uh, in terms of talent on paper, you don't win games on paper, but on paper, this is the best generation the U.S. men's national team ever had. I I agree with you. It was a disaster getting grouped at home. We were the first host nation in Copa America history to get a group stage exit. This was So we, we broke a negative record right there. But at the same time, the U.S. men's national team has looked iffy for years under head coach Greg Berhalter that just got fired. I think that right now it hurts and it sucks. We we didn't like it, it, but it could have been the disaster we needed to fix that. Fire the coach, get a good coach now. And if you get a good coach, this team can do something special in the World Cup. Now win it. I don't think we have the players to win it. I don't think we have the players even to make it to a final. I think we would even need luck to make it to a semifinals. But this is a team that can push at home to make it to a quarterfinals, which we have done in the past. But that would be already a tremendous accomplishment. And if we can pull an upset there one game at a time, maybe you make it to a semifinal. But for that, you would need a mix of the best possible coach you can get. The players need to be in good form. And some luck, but but like you said, if this summer was a disaster, but if we take the next step and it's the right step of hiring a good coach, it might have been worth it. Yeah, I mean, it, it did seem like it was going to take something like this to get Burhalter out. Because um, yeah, if they advanced, maybe even one around, see, probably six rounds of the World Cup. Um, in terms of like, like the like the structural integrity of of U.S. men's soccer is if they they make a good pick for their next head coach. Do you think that like the rest of the pieces are in place? I mean, there's the the talent on the field, but also like USA Soccer as an organization. Do you think this is an organization that can continue to build toward you know being that much more competitive internationally? It's complicated to know. We need to see how the next generation of players are going to come up. We're got to see how also the the executives in US Soccer what what they have in mind, right? The CEO, for example, his name is JT Batson. He took over early last year, if I'm not mistaken, or like close to the 2022 World Cup. So he just got there a year and a half or so, or two years ago. Uh, the sporting director, Matt Crocker, that is trying to hire a new coach. He, he's been around for like a year or so, a little bit over a year. So there, there were a lot of changes. And the first few steps were poor. They rehired Greg Berhalter. Things didn't go well. Uh, this is also Federation recovering from a massive lawsuit that they lost a lot of money. Uh, it, it's complicated to know. I think they they need to use this World Cup, capitalize off it because they can make a lot of money off it and then spend it the right way right after. For that reason, when you talk about the business aspect of it, it's not just about, about hiring a coach that will get you results. It's also hiring a coach that will get the fan base excited, get everyone 
ready for the World Cup, that will attract more sponsors. The donors will be happy and, and more money will flow in. So it's not just about the best hire. And I think that's also one of the reasons why I heard they even fired Greg Berhalter. It was the poor results, obviously. That's number one. But they were thinking, that there, apparently there were talks in U.S. soccer, that like, we can't go into the 2026 World Cup with no excitement. Everyone just like hating on the team, wanting the coach out. How are you going to get money from the sponsors? How are you going to get money from the donors? No one will care. And that was the sentiment. Maybe they, what they need right now from a soccer and business perspective is a coach that can unite everyone again with the national team. Because it was very – not. I would even say it wasn't really divided. People were actually hating Burhalter. Most of it was like 90% of the fan base didn't want this guy or more. That's the next step for them. Yeah, and I just have to throw in that Gareth Southgate just – step down you know not sure if it was really his decision or not but as the the uk coach you know it's a different standard there you know they are trying to win every international tournament or they have ex expectations around that every time they play um do you, do you think he could be a, a good a good fit for the us i mean obviously he's just one person of of many but um but i think that's where the attention is at this moment i hope not i hope not um gareth southgate has if you, if you look at it from the macro perspective, he made it to a Euro, two Euro finals. He made it to a World Cup semifinals and a World Cup um, quarterfinals. But when you look at the players England has, England is a very strong team. They're up there to compete for trophy. You said it yourself, like to compete for trophies in every tournament they go in, they should be. They haven't won a trophy since 1966, but this is a team to fight for trophies. They're very good players. Uh, but Gareth Southgate, when you look at it from the macro that it looks fine but when you look at tournament by tournament case by case every single tournament no exceptions he has lost to any team that matches his talent or is maybe just a tiny bit below this euro he also had an easy bracket again the toughest team he faced was a dutch team that isn't even that good anymore and then when he finally played a team that was about his level or better in terms of talent he lost to spain in the final and spain was much better so I, I don't think he's good. He's also, I don't know if you know this, but he's also Burhalter's mentor. Yeah, didn't know that. Well, th that, that so yeah, you might want to, you know, pick someone from a different school of thought, perhaps, yes. given that we're moving from the Burhalter era. Yes. Uh, we'll leave it there. Really appreciate the chat. Filippo Silva, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Owen. That's it for today. Share this episode with any soccer fans in your life or give us a shout on social media. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.